Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Jan today looked at an interesting phishing attempt uh, that uh, we actually received at our handler email address. It attempts uh, to overlay a login dialog uh, to a legitimate page by using iframes. And while it sort of almost worked, it was a little bit uh, broken and probably sent to us uh, by mistake. One mistake was that, first of all, it didn't uh, fill in a variable that's required. Now, the variable domain, uh, maybe they just misspelled it and it should actually be a domain. Uh, but if that's filled in correctly, then the user's email address is essentially sort of pre-filled as a username and it just asks for uh, the password. The other part that didn't really quite work right in this particular attempt is the entire screen screen layout seem to be a more targeted at the mobile device or devices with smaller screens. This may also be sort of some uh, limited quality control on the attacker side and well, and it's probably no different from real developers. And I ran into these issues myself where it's really hard to sort of test all the different browsers and screen resolutions that uh, users use to visit your site. So yep. Uh, doesn't always look uh, the way you expect it uh, to look. Part of this attack is also limited by the X-Frame options header, of course, more recently replaced with content security policy, which also limits what can be displayed inside an iframe and uh, can make at least the execution of some of uh, these attacks more difficult. And Adam Chester with Trusted Sec wrote an interesting blog post about how to inject a code on Mac OS via third party frameworks. Mac OS made it more and more difficult to execute untrusted code. So a lot of the code on Mac OS is digitally signed and well, you can't just uh, alter this digital signed code, but what you can sometimes accomplish is you can have the digitally sign code execute your code. And that's of course uh, possible if the digital sign code is uh, some more complex framework that can be used uh, to execute other code. Now, Adam is looking at two different cases here. First is .NET Core. The .NET Core framework is often used sort of for cross-platform development and it's available for Mac OS. What I actually found more interesting is the second part of the blog post where he's talking about the Electron framework. Electron is sort of an up and coming uh, framework, uh, really popular. Slack is probably sort of one of the more famous applications being written in Electron. And what essentially is it's Node.js. Uh, it allows you to run JavaScript code. And the idea of Electron is that you can write applications just like you would write them for the web with JavaScript and HTML and then run them as native applications on different operating systems. So once you're able to execute code using Electron, then of course you have the signed and trusted Electron binary at your disposal, which also typically has a lot of entitlements, which is another problem with macOS. macOS limits what different applications can do. And if you have ever run into this, it can be sometimes annoying, but actually has a valid security function where in order for example, to access files in your home directory, you need to give the applications permission to do so. And Slack often has those permissions. So with that, Electron has those permissions. And all you really have to do here is set a single environment variable. Electron run as node. That way, once you start Slack and you have this environment variable set to one, you're actually starting Node.js and you're now able to to execute arbitrary code. So a uh, pretty straightforward, also works with Visual Studio Code, Discord, Bloodhound, and other applications that are written in Electron. 
And Cisco published a blog post around some significant improvements that they made to the signature coverage in Snort as well as in Clam AV around the Cobalt Strike platform. Now, Cobalt Strike is one of those adversary emulation frameworks, a fairly complex piece of software often used by red teams as uh, Talos here points out in their blog, but of course as popular by actual attackers. And uh, Talos here points out that 66% of ransomware attacks that they were involved in as part of the incident response were actually using Cobalt Strike. So Cobalt Strike is certainly something that you should take seriously. And even if you don't use Snort or Clam AV, the report that came with uh, these signatures and with the blog post has a lot of details about how to detect Cobalt Strike, how it works, and well, a really lot of background on this particular tool that should help with detecting it. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening. Don't forget to patch the zero logon problem if you haven't done that so, but already mentioned it a couple times in the past. And talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.